and it's in bunches. You have a big bunch here, and a big bunch here, and a big bunch there, and another one over here. If you look at a patch of skin, the vast majority of that skin is going to be white, not dark. But if you take this, the melanin that's in these clumps, so it's a, imagine a three-dimensional ball of melanin, a clump, and you spread it very thin, now you're going to have a whole bunch of it. And so instead of having a bunch of really, really dark spots with a whole bunch of, with even more white area, you're going to have a lot of darker color. And so this is what we're seeing here. So over here, the melanin is actually going to be the brownish tinge here. And so in this skin, you see that the melanin gets really spread out. And so if this is the top of the skin, so you can imagine if you're looking from the outside of the skin, there isn't much area that you can look where you're not going to see melanin on the bottom, right? But over here, there is very little melanin to be found. And what is there is so clumpy that you can't even find it. You, I mean, you're, you can look all day here. You're probably not going to find it. Because over here, there's more melanin, and it's spread out, and some of it is working its way up almost to the top of the skin. So it's much easier to see what is there. Yeah. What do you know when you stand out in the sun to get darker? We're, we're coming to that. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so like, like he's alluding to, that might be the next slide. No? Yes, yes, it's the next bullet point. So the amount of melanin that we make is largely due to genetics, but also can be a response to our environment. And so the longer we're outside, the more UV that we're exposed to, the more melanin we will make. And so it's sort of like our genetics tell us what sort of environment we expect to be in that determines how much melanin we make to begin with, but then our body can respond to how much UV we actually are being exposed to in our lives. And so as we get exposed, we make more melanin, but it's not permanent, right? If I go out and I get a tan, I'm not tan for the rest of my life. I'm gonna go back to being very, very pale if I don't keep getting sun. So the skin color is primarily based off of how much melanin is visible. But a couple other things can influence our skin tone. Number one is hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is just the, the protein in our blood that carries oxygen, right? What color is hemoglobin? We all know it's red. And so the amount of blood that we have near the outer surface of our skin can influence our skin color and make it pink. One thing we don't think about a lot is carotene. Carotene is a yellow-orange color. That's what makes egg yolks yellow. It makes carrots orange. That is a very hydrophobic molecule. Hydrophobic, remember, means it doesn't like water. So it's going to go into the fat of your body. And a lot of the fat in our body is in our hypodermis. So if you have a bunch of this in your body, it's going to locate itself in your hypodermis. And so if you have little melanin on top of that, you can actually see that. And so if you go and you eat, I don't know how many carrots you'd have to eat, but if you ate a whole bunch of carrots, you might actually start to look like an Oompa Loompa. Okay? If someone wants to try it, I would like to see it. I don't like carrots though, so I'm not trying. So these terms are not something you're responsible for knowing, but I think it's interesting, and so I wanted to include it. Okay? So just based on the color of our skin, we can diagnose a lot of problems, whether those problems have anything to do with our skin or not. So the first one is cyanosis. So cyan cyanosis is a, a lack of oxygen on our hemoglobin. And so what color do we get if we don't have enough oxygen? Blue. We turn blue, right? And so that is called being cyanotic. If, if we're turning blue, if we see that we're blue, 
we know we're not getting enough oxygen, and then hopefully we do something about it. Okay? You, you laugh, but I'm actually the poster child for not doing something. I had pneumonia about a year and a half ago. I, I wasn't thinking. I didn't know I had pneumonia. Let me start with that. I thought I just, I had the flu and it turned into pneumonia. So I thought I just had the flu and I thought I turned blue because I had such a bad fever. And so I, I was having vasoconstriction, right? I, I was thinking, right? I wasn't just being dumb about it. I was thinking, this is what my body is doing. Everything's fine. Turned out I actually had pneumonia and I was cyanotic. That's why I was turning blue. So if you turn blue, do something about it. Arrhythma is your skin turning red. Sunburn is arrhythma. You get blood flow to your skin to help it heal. That's one, pri one primary reason for that. Arrhythma would also be when you just turn flush, trying to get rid of excess body heat. Would that also be like scratching? Or is that something It'd be the same idea. So if you scratch yourself, it turns red, right? So it's the same idea as the sunburn. Your blood flow is increasing there to help you heal. So pallor is going to be when you turn pale. It's going to be the opposite of arrhythma. <laughs> Albinism is what albino animals or albino people have. That's just a lack of melanin. So the melanocytes don't function. So they don't have melanin. And so what you see is what's left behind. It's similar to talk about when the leaves change color. They always say that that red or orange or yellow is always there, you just can't see it because all the green chlorophyll. Once the chlorophyll goes away, then you can see the color underneath. And so uh, albinism, you don't have the melanocytes, and so you're just seeing all of those other things more noticeably. Jaundice is when you turn yellow. When we break down blood in our body, red blood cells, we make something called bilirubin. Bilirubin is a protein and that protein is yellow in color. Our, one of the main functions of our liver is to break down bilirubin. If our liver isn't functioning very well, this yellow bilirubin builds up, and we turn yellow. If you're light-skinned, you can actually see your skin turn yellow. In everybody, though, you see a lot of yellow show up in the whites of your eyes. Definitely. I get a jaundice and she was yellow, so they put her under a UV light to help her. But she, she was very young. Right? Yeah, she's a newborn. Yes, exactly. And so a lot of, a lot of, I mean, it's fairly common. A lot of newborns don't have fully functioning livers when they're born, and so they get jaundice. But another way to break down bilirubin is light. Light will help break down bilirubin. And so you can put a baby under a UV lamp, or a lot, uh, just a lamp, or put them literally just put them in a window like a like a potted plant and they will help break down this bilirubin. There's nothing wrong with that, right? As the baby develops, their, li their liver will catch up, and they'll be perfectly fine. I would guess a fair number of us that were in here, I don't know if I had this problem or not. It's common, it's not a big deal. So we are all look fairly healthy. There's not going to be many of us that get jaundice, but in the world as a, as a, as a whole, Jaundice in adults is, exact, is actually fairly common because of hepatitis. Hepatitis is, are the different viruses that will destroy your liver. And so one way that you know that someone may have hepatitis is they may have jaundice. You'll see it in their eyes. And then finally we have a hematoma, which is just a bruise. And we all know what a bruise looks like. We all know what a bruise means, right? Let's take a break now. Well, we're going to take two shorter breaks. And so let's come back at 20 after on that clock. So in about seven minutes. That clock's broken. Well, they, the minute hand is just about exactly right. So come back in seven minutes. <laughs> no, it just happens to be just an hour off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so 
end up with ponds in the back. And there's no like moving water or anything, but it's really just stale water. And uh, I went out there and played some YouTube bullfrog noises to see what was in the back. <laughs> These big old bullfrogs back there and the noises. I'm like a frog hunting. You know. With all the rain the other day, I opened the front door. And I heard right. some of the frogs. Um, I live next to the woods. I always hear frogs behind me. But they were just, it was just like a, it was just like a parking complex. Yeah. I don't even know what, and it had rained for four months, and all of a sudden, there's just frogs everywhere. Yeah. Or I even, not the long. You can bring us a frog leg on Wednesday? Oh, yeah. We've got to conjure up the courage to walk into the darkness and search them out. <laughs> Not good for the snake, you know. You got Marcus in there too? Yeah, it's here by now, really. based off the amount of melanin, and the amount of melanin is, is due to both genetics and the environment that we individually expose to. And so the, the baseline amount of melanin that you start with is going to be based on genetics, and that's based off of a long, long, long time of evolution, right? And so we've evolved to balance the good and the bad effects of UV. We always think about the bad effects, right? We want to protect ourselves from UV. So if you live in an environment where you have a lot of UV exposure, you're going to produce more, me more melanin to prevent those bad effects. But there's also that good effect of creating vitamin D. And so over the long term, a population will evolve to get just the right amount of melanin for that location to prevent the bad effects but allow the good effects. And so if a population exists at a, in a northern latitude, and so far away from the equator, they're not going to get much UV radiation exposure. And so if they have a lot of melanin, they're going to block all of the UV, and so they're not going to get that much vitamin D. And because they don't have that much exposure, they don't have to protect themselves very much from the bad effects. And so they have very little melanin. But if a population is near the equator, there's going to be a lot more UV exposure. And so you need more melanin to protect your skin. And because there's so much UV, even if you have a lot of melanin, you're still going to get enough UV in order to get that vitamin D production. And vitamin D is important in the uptake of calcium. And that's very important in women who are lactate. And so it's, it's theorized, it's not proven, but that could be one explanation of why in general, within a population of similar genetic background, women tend to be lighter skinned than the men. Because the, the women need more of this vitamin D. Cross this slide out. So we're going to move on to melanin. We're going to talk about the last three things that are in our skin, the hair, nails, and cutaneous glands. So those three things are called accessory organs of the skin. They're part of the integumentary system, but they are not skin. Right? They're part of the skin system, but they are not, in fact, skin. Hair and nails are very similar. Okay? It's going to be very easy to think of our nails as simply very large, thick hairs. And so the hair, the actual hair, and the nails themselves are mostly dead, keratinized cells. So when, you, when I look at my nail, what I'm seeing are dead cells 
with a whole bunch of keratin. And there is soft keratin, is also hard keratin. And so it doesn't take a brain surgeon to look at your nails and say, well, if that's mostly collagen, my nails are very different than my skin, right? But they both have collagen. The skin has this soft keratin. So it is, it's firm, but it's pliable. I mean, if my skin was stiff, it'd be hard to move. The joints wouldn't work very well. And so we have this pliable keratin. The hair and nails are hard keratin. And so at the most basic level, they're essentially the same molecule, but the hard keratin is more compact, the keratin is more dense, pushed together, and there's also a lot more cross-linking between the molecules. And so in soft keratin, you may have keratin molecules that look like that. And they can all kind of move independently. And so that's going to allow your skin to stretch in different directions. The hard keratin is going to be this, but then you're going to have a whole bunch of connections all holding this together. So you get a, essentially a mesh. And mesh does not stretch for it as well. Because it's, as you pull one, you're going to have to pull all of them. And so that's going to be this hard keratin. And you'd also have maybe more of these vertical lines making it more dense. And so, uh, the scientific name, the official name for hair is pilus. If you have multiple of them, it will be pili. And so, it's essentially a very long, tall stack of dead, keratinized cells. It's going to be one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. And it's going to be growing out of what's called a hair follicle. The follicle is essentially the, the part of your skin that the hair comes out of. It's just that tube that the hair comes out of. We have hair on a good portion of our body. We, uh, there's a few places that we don't have them. There are obviously the palms of our hands and our soles. There's a, a list of some other places we don't have them. And so the palms and the soles are thick skin. And so, because they're thick skin, we know that there will not be hair there. But if you're thin skin, most likely there is, but there are some places that they are not. Like my fingers, right? You can't see it, but I have hair down here on my fingers. I don't have it here, and I don't have it here. If you look at yours, you will have some sort of hair, maybe so small it's almost imperceptible, but you'll have hair down here. Some people have hair on the middle part of their finger, some don't. I don't, it's genetic. No one will have it at the tip, okay? But it's all thin skin. It's all basically the same exact thing. Some of it is going to have hair, and some of it is not. And so the density of hair can vary in different places on our body. And so if we're talking about our limbs, our arms, our legs, our torso, that's our, our trunk, it's going to be about 55 to 70 hairs for every square centimeter. So a, a centimeter is about that big. So for every square like that, it's going to be 55 to 70. If you have on your face, it's going to be about 10 times that much. And the face and your scalp are probably going to be about the same density. If, you're, if you don't have facial hair, you're still going to have the follicles, there's not going to be the hair coming out of them. On the average person's head, there's going to be about 100,000 hairs. And we all know from seeing people, we go to the beach, there is definitely a difference between hairy people and non-hairy people, right? Yes, men versus women, men then tend to have more hair than women, 
But just within men, there are hairy men and non-hairy men. And some of the non-hairy men do not wax. They're just naturally non-hairy. It's not necessarily that the hairy men have more hair. It's that the hair that they have is more noticeable. And so the hair may be longer, it may be darker, and it may be thicker. And so if you look at Tutu people, someone that comes across as being hairy, just genetically, the hair that they have on their body is going to be more noticeable. And so it looks like they have more hair. In reality, they don't. So there are actually three types of hair. I mean, I think looking at an adult person, you can very easily pick out two types. There actually is a third type. And the reason you don't see that is because it's only present in the fetus. And so unless a fetus is born prematurely, you will never see this at all. So the first type is called lanugo hair. This is like peach fuzz, but it's only present in the fetus. It, it shows up in the last three months of development. So if you're born premature, up to three months before, you may see this type of hair. But if, you, if a baby goes to term, you're not going to see that. This lanugo hair gets replaced by vellus hair. So vellus hair is what we think of as peach fuzz hair. Right? We all know what, what that's like. Little kids, that's what they're going to have uh, covering their body. They're going to have the hair on their scalp, and then they're going to have this vellus hair. So in women, this is about two-thirds of their hair. The, the hair you have on your arms and your legs, this is going to be mostly vellus hair. On men, this is only going to be about a tenth of the hair. On children, this is going to be all of their hair except the eyebrows, eyelashes, and the hair on their head. So the, the pigmented hair that a child has will not be this. Everything else will be vellus hair. The hair on our heads is going to be terminal hair. This is going to be very long. It's going to be much thicker or coarser, and it's usually going to be pigmented. So this is going to make be the hair on our scalp, our eyelashes, our eyebrows. It's going to be pubic hair after puberty, and facial hair of men it will be terminal hair. And then a lot of the hair on our arms and legs, our chest, our back, will be terminal hair. So those are probably the locations where the difference is most noticeable between men and women. Something like arm hair on a woman is more likely to be vellus hair on a man is more likely be terminal So this is a picture of our hair follicle. We've seen this picture before, right? We've, we've gone over a lot of this. And so if you look at a hair, you can break it into three parts. The bulb is going to be at the bottom, where it gets very big, shaped like a bulb. Then we have the root. The root is going to be the part of the hair that's not the bulb but it's still below the surface of the skin. And then the shaft is going to be the part of the hair that is above the skin. Down here, there's a number of things, other things that we talked about and that we'll also see moving forward. So this is a picture of the bulb at the bottom of a hair. Okay? And so if we look at the hair, the hair is the, the reddish orange or pink part here. At the very bottom, the bulb is not a solid thing of just hair. In the middle here, it's called the, a dermal papilla. It is the same exact term as the waves between the dermis and the epidermis. It is not the same thing though. Okay? Don't blame me. I didn't do it. This is also called a dermal papilla. Okay? So around this, this is dermis. And so that's where the, the dermal comes from. And it, it's kind of the same shape as the wave up top, and so it's also called a dermal papilla. And so this dermal papilla are cells, and they are going to provide the nutrients for the cells that are making the hair itself. The hair matrix 
is going to be the area around that papilla, and there are going to be mitotically active cells there. So these are living cells that are actively dividing. This is where the hair is going to grow. Hair grows from the bottom and pushes the old stuff up. So the hair matrix is going to be this area here, and these cells are dividing, which makes the tissue grow, because now you have more cells, and so the old cells get pushed up. If you look at a hair in a cross section, there are three layers. In the very center, there is the medulla. There are cells here, but there aren't a ton of them. It's mostly going to be air. So you can think of the center of your hair as being hollow. It's not perfectly hollow, because there are some cells there, but there is actually a lot of air space there. The vast majority of the hair shaft is going to be cortex. And this is going to be made up of a bunch of layers of keratinized cells. So if you're going to be down at the very bottom of the hair, some of them may be alive. But up at the tip of the hair, they're all going to be dead. And then on the outside is the cuticle. These are dead skin, dead cells, and they kind of sit on here like shingles. They, where they, they kind of, they're attached at one end, not at the other, and they kind of overlap on each other. And so it's saying if the free edges, which would be the flapping edges, are going to face upward. And so it looks like this hair is growing down, because it's, the three edges are going to point toward the end of the hair. If we go back a slide and look at this, we can see the medulla in the middle here, and then there is the cortex out here. The cuticle is very, very thin, and so you can't see it on here. It's not labeled. It's, it's very, very thin, and so it, you can't even see it. So the hair follicle, we said, is the tube in the skin that the hair is going to come out of. It's going to be, at the base, it's going to be usually in the dermis. Part of it may touch the hypodermis, and then it's going to come up through the epidermis. In that follicle is going to be what's called the epithelial root sheet. So this is going to be epithelial tissue. It's going to wrap around the bulb of the hair and extend up a little bit. And it's going to be, it says the source of stem cells. And so the stem cells are going to be in this epithelial root sheet. These are going to be epithelial stem cells. And then they are going to form the hair. So these are the cells that are going to turn into the matrix that makes new hair cells that pushes the hair up. And there's also going to be another root sheet made out of connective tissue. This is going to be from the dermis, and it's going to be a fairly dense connective tissue. And this is, it'll be around the, the, ep the epithelial root sheet. So you'll have the hair itself, and then around that will be the epithelial root sheet, and then around that will be the connective root sheath. And that will be all inside of the hair follicle. With the hair follicle, there's also some receptors. They're just nerve fibers that allow us to tell if something is touching our hair. And so if I just touch the hair on the back of my arm, I can feel it, right? I don't have to actually touch my skin to know that I'm touching. Just touching the hair that causes the hair to move, and then there's hair receptors touch the base of the hair, and they can sense whether the hair is being moved. And then finally, there's this piloerector muscle, or the erector pili, which we've seen before. That's the muscle that's going to pull tight and cause the hair to stand up on end. So if we go back, remember, we have this muscle here that attaches to the base of the kind of the base of the hair and the follicle can pull it tight. So as the hair grows, it goes through three cycles. 
First is antigen stage. Most of our hairs are going to be found in the antigen stage. This is when they are actively growing. So the stem cells are multiplying, they're growing, they're making new hair cells, and so the hair is getting longer and longer and longer. The root sheath is going to make the hair matrix, and the hair cells, the living hair cells, are going to make keratin, which makes the, the hair hard. And they're going to, as they move up, they'll make keratin, and then they will die. And then what's left behind are dead cells with a bunch of keratin. After a while, the hair will reach what's called the catagen stage. The mitosis stops. So we're no longer making new hair cells. The hair is going to stop growing. The sheath around the bulb is going to die. Remember, that's the source, the source of the stem cells. So if that sheath dies, the, the hair will stop growing. And so what we end up with is called club hair. This is hair that's still attached to our bodies, but if you pull it, it will come out. Hair in antigen stage is rooted in. If I grab a clump of hair and pull, I'm probably going to get a few hairs. The vast majority will stay behind, but I might get one or two. Those are probably going to be in the catagen stage. Finally, we have the telogen stage. This is where nothing is really happening. And I think the next slide has pictures of these, and you'll really see what we mean by that. But it says that the papilla is going to reach the bulge, and we'll, we'll see what that means right here. So this is the first stage, antigen stage over here. And so I, what I want to point out is where the bulb is in terms of up and down. So as you go from here to here, the bulb goes down. Do you see that? The hair is growing up, but at the same time, the bulb is going down. So in antigen stage, as it's growing, we're going to make a new hair. This is an old hair that was left over from the last cycle. Right here is the new hair. So this is going to grow. As it grows, it's going to push the old one out. So now our new one has grown. That's now this one. The old one is gone. So this is still antigen. As we get to the next stage, catagen, our sheath is gone. So our sheath was around here. It's gone. The matrix is not nearly as, as big. And so what we have now is just kind of the end of the hair. It's not really growing anymore. And it is moving its way out. It's on its way out. It's called club hair because the end is still kind of, kind of big and round. But the dermal papilla is still down at the bottom. As the, as, the, the, as the end of the hair moved down, the dermal papilla moved down with it. In this stage, the hair itself is moving out, but the dermal papilla has not. In the last stage, telogen, the dermal papilla is moved back up to where it started. So now this hair, as the new one starts to grow, will become the old one here, and it will get pushed up. It's possible at this stage that the hair will just fall out on its own. If it doesn't, it'll get pushed out by the next one. So our nails are very, very scant. Go ahead. Some of our hair get really long despite some of the hair grow. When all my hair eventually just reaches a certain height and fall out. Yes, but it has to get really, really long. And so the the, the length for it to get to this point and fall out is really long. It takes a long time. And so it's not, as the hair gets really, really long, it's not going to grow for your entire life. Eventually, you'll reach a maximum. Hopefully, no one ever waits long enough to find that maximum. But you might get yourself in a Guinness Book of World Records. Okay. And so our nails, like I said, are, are very similar to, the, to, to, our, to our hair. It's essentially the same process. Fingernails and toenails are going to be exactly the same. And they're, they're clear and 
hard, and they're going to come from the stratum corneum, which was that top layer. They are again dead cells with keratin, but this time they're hard keratin, unlike the stratum corneum that they're coming from. And so nails have some obvious functions, right? The protection for our fur, for our fingers. We can use them to scrape things. One thing that you don't necessarily think of is when you go to pick up something very small, you have tit the soft tissue in the end of your finger. If you didn't have that nail there, that tissue would just kind of fold back over your finger. And so your nail provides kind of a backstop. It prevents that tissue from going any further so that you can pick up little things at the tip of your finger. So that, that's what this bullet point is saying. So there are a number of parts to our nail. The main part of our nail, what, what you're going to see, is called the nail plate. That's the hard part of your nail. There's a free edge. That's the white part that hangs over the tip of your finger. That's the part that you're constantly having to trim. There's the nail body. That's the visible part of the nail that's attached to your finger. And then there's the nail root that extends underneath the skin at the base of your nail. And so you have the free edge sticking up here, then the nail body, and then down here, it's not labeled, but you can't see it, is going to be the nail root. Right, we'll see it on, actually, it's right there. So down here is kind of a cross section of a finger, right? So there's the free edge hanging off, and then the nail body, and then the nail root extends up under the skin there. There are a bunch of other parts labeled here that we're going to see on this slide. So the nail fold is going to be the skin on either side of your nail. That little kind of puffy part of skin on either side of your nail is going to be the nail fold. You have the nail groove. That's the little slit or the groove between the nail and the nail fold. So here and here. You have the nail bed. That's the skin underneath your nail, where the nail is connected. It's actually called the hip hipponychium. That is not a term you need to know. Okay? So you, you want you to know nail bed. You don't need to know that, that, that word. You have the nail matrix. So just like with the hair matrix, the nail matrix is the part that's actually growing. It's growing through mitosis. And so the cells are dividing, making new cells, pushing the old ones out. Your fingernails are going to grow at about a millimeter per week. Your toenails are essentially the same, but a little bit slower. The real reason it seems, at least for me, I think it's common for most people, it seems like your nail, your toenails grow much slower. It's actually because you're constantly wearing shoes. They're, they're always getting worn down. And so you're wearing them down as they're growing. So it looks like they're growing slower, but they're actually almost the same speed as your fingernails. If you look at the base of your nail, there's always that little white spot. At the base, that's called the lanuli. That's that opaque, opaque meaning you can't see through it, crescent at the proximal. Remember the proximal is towards the connection, the proximal end of your nail. And it's just because the matrix there is thicker. If, if the matrix is thicker, there's going to be more keratin there, and so it's going to be a whiter color. Then there is the eponychium, which is the cuticle. So that, if you look at the base of your finger, there's a little tiny membrane of skin that overhangs the nail a little bit. I know my wife is always pushing them back, and every time she does it, I said, why do you do that? Evolution put it there for a purpose, right? Let it be. But nope, gotta push it back. So that is the cuticle. That's dead skin. That's mostly going to be kind of a protection mechanism. Okay, so that's nails. Questions? Yeah. Kind of rigid as in kind of yeah. this this way. Mm -hmm. Your nails weren't like that normally. Mine are. Like, when I had it, like you had this. But your others don't. 
I don't know who that is. I assumed everybody said ridges. Mine was really weird for like a couple of years. Yeah. It's so weird. It's got like a weird. You're special, I guess. Your, your normal ones don't have ridges. Now I have a lower self esteem. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's nails. Questions about nails or hair? Okay, we're going to move on to cutaneous glands. We talked about glands in general on the last section. How, how many supplies do we have? Less than 10. Okay. So we'll finish the slides and we'll take a break. Another short break and come back. The last thing we have to talk about are cutaneous glands. So like I said, we talked about glands in general. Now we're going to talk about glands in our skin. And that's what cutaneous glands are. Cutaneous glands are glands in our skin. We have five types of the cutaneous glands. There are the miracrine and apocrine sweat glands that we talked about. There are sebaceous glands that we have mentioned, we haven't really talked about, but we've mentioned. There's something called ceruminous glands, or ceruminous glands, and then there are mammary glands. These are all glands that are part of the integumentary system and are in our skin. There are pictures of apocrine, miracrine, and sebaceous glands up here. I don't need you to get too much out of these pictures. What I want you to see is that in all of these cases, we're going to have cells that are going to put, secrete something into ducts or empty spaces. Okay? So a, these glands are going to have cells that make something, and they're going to put that something into an empty space called a duct. So here, they're very easy to see. You have cells lining these ducts, the cells in ducts. Over here, you have cells, and then it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a duct here. And so this is going, this is a sebaceous gland, so it's going to secrete this out into here, and it's going to work its way over into the hair follicle. We said there are the two types of sweat glands. There's the apocrine sweat glands, and then the miracrine sweat glands. Functionally, what would, what they make, what was the main difference between the two? Right. And, and so the apocrine sweat gland is going to go to a hair follicle, as the miracrine has its own pore. What's different about what they produce? Miracrine is just pure sweat. It's basically salt water. There really isn't much more in it. The apocrine is similar, but it's going to have fatty acids in it also. And so this is going to be that, that stress sweat, sweat that can really smell. And you said that the smell, the bad smell is called bromidrosis. Think about a sweaty guy and you're saying, bro, that's bad, right? It's bromidrosis. <laughs> Mirrors, the miracrine is just sweat. And we have a lot of these. They're going to cover the vast majority of our bodies. There's three to four million of these, with a lot of them on our palms, the soles of our feet, and our forehead. And around these sweat glands are myoepithelial cells. These are just responsive cells that our body can control, and when they get turned on, they're going to contract and they're kind of wrapped around the sweat gland, and so when they contract, they're just gonna squeeze whatever is in the gland out. And so if we need to sweat, these myoepithelial cells will contract, and the sweat that is in them will get pushed out. And so if you sweat, and it contracts, it, and then you stop sweating, it'll release, and as it gets, it'll make more, and then if you get sweat again, it'll contract again and push it all out. If you continue to sweat long term, it may either do that, that cycle over and over again, or it may just stay contracted. And so as it makes new sweat, 
There is no storage space. So anything that gets made immediately is going to come out. And so you may notice, I, I know I notice it, when you first start to sweat, you may get a big burst of sweat. And then as you continue to sweat, it may not be as much because you kind of have all that sweat saved up, ready to go. And then it all comes out and then your body, you don't sweat as much as you can make it. You don't have any saved up at that point. And so that sweat is basically blood plasma. Your body's going to take blood plasma and pull most of it out. Most of what's in there is going to screen it, filter it out. What's going to get through is the water and the sodium chloride. And you're even going to hold back some of the sodium chloride. So you don't, your body doesn't want to lose too much, so it's going to hold some of that sodium chloride back. Some of the drugs that we take can also get through. So one of the ways that we lose drugs that we take, the reason we have to continuously take them, is we, we're losing them. The vast majority of it gets broken down in our body, but some of it will actually come out of our sweat glands. 99% of our sweat is just water, and it's acidic water, which provides some of that acid mantle that inhibits bacterial growth. And even as we're sitting here, we are sweating. We don't see it, we don't notice it, we don't feel wet, so it's called insensible perspiration. We don't sense it, so it's insensible. We lose about half a liter of water this way every day. Half a liter of water is just a standard bottle of water, like, like, like he's got back there. That's, called, that's half a liter. The standard water bottle is half a liter. We lose that much water through our skin every day, regardless of what we do. Then there is diaphoresis. This is what we think of as sweating. This is sweating for the purpose of cooling our body, right? If you're exercising, you may lose in a liter an hour. And so if you're actually sweating a lot, you need to drink a lot, right? So just to keep up with the sweat, to not reduce the amount of water in your body, you have to drink two of those water bottles every hour. Now our body is good at dealing with lessening water amounts, right? And so if we don't drink one liter an hour, we don't die, right? We can lose a lot of water without having an issue. But if you want to maintain the same amount of water, you'd actually have to drink a liter an hour. So we're going to move on to sebaceous glands. These are glands that we've seen on diagrams, glands that we've mentioned, but we haven't talked about them too much. These are next to and attached to hair follicles. Okay? It says that they use holocrine secretion style. We had the three types of secretion. There's the apocrine, the miracrine, and the holocrine. What was the holocrine method? The dead, the dead cells, right? And so you're going to have cells that are going to make the oil. The cells are then going to die, leaving behind the oil. That oil is called sebum. And so that oil serves a couple purposes. Number one, it's going to keep our skin from becoming too dry, and it's also going to provide sort of a protective factor in even one more layer on our skin in order to pr protect our, our body. And it's not as common now, but it used to be a long time ago. For moisturizer, people would use something called lanolin. If you go to Walmart, you will find lanolin on the shelf. That is skin oil from a sheep. People used to collect that. I don't know how they collect it. But you collect it, you put it in a tube, and then sell it to somebody. Okay? That is a lanolin. Next type of gland is the ceruminous glands. These are essentially what's going to make the earwax in our ears. It doesn't make what we can make exactly what we consider earwax. It's going to make a secretion. It's going to combine with sebum, and it's going to combine with dead epithelial cells that have kind of flaked off the inside of our ear. And that mixture is called earwax, which is the technical term is cerumen. 
And so these are going to make one of the three ingredients to make earwax. And the earwax has a few purposes. It keeps our eardrum from drying out. So your eardrum needs to be able to flex. If it dries out, it's not going to flex. It keeps water from getting too far down into our ear. Wax is water resistant, right? So it's going to help keep the water out. It has some antibacterial properties. Keeps some of the bacteria out of our ear. And we have hair in our ears. None of us are all too old, and so they're probably not too big. But we have those hairs there. And when you get that earwax on them, they're going to be sticky. And so imagine you have a bunch of dust flying around. If that dust gets into your ear, it's not going to get past a bunch of sticky hairs to get down to the functional part of your ear. So it's going to trap that dust, and then over time, the earwax will come out of your ear, and the dust will go with it. Finally, we have the mammary glands. Mammary glands are the glands that are going to produce milk. These are only going to be found in mammals, which of course humans are. They're only going to be actually producing milk during pregnancy and lactation. They're very, very similar to apocrine sweat glands. They're essentially an apocrine sweat gland that has evolved to do a slightly different purpose. And so it's going to be a bunch of glands that have ducts that converge together and all come out of the nipple at the same place. And in mammals, there's going to be what are called mammary ridges or milk lines. So in every mammal, humans included, there will be two lines of mammary glands. And so whether male or female, we have these, right? And so in humans, we do have two rows. There's just one in each row. If you can imagine, if you ever had a dog or a cat that had puppies or kittens, if you ever had a kitten, a cat that had puppies, that'd be amazing. But if you've ever seen an animal with babies, they, these nipples become much more pronounced, right? And there's usually going to be a line of them. There might be four or five or six in a line, but there's always two rows of these mammary glands. This is just a, a summary, summary, simple, simple. A summary of the glands that we talked about. We're not going to go over this anymore. Questions about this lecture? Okay. So let's take another break. It is 8.02. Let's come back at 8.10. So in eight minutes, we'll do some of those review questions, and then we'll take our quiz.